It's only for the nation. A radical guy. It's time to make changes. Bring in interviews and radical education. Yeah, yeah. A better Welcome future. Welcome to really another need. episode of A Radical Podcast, where we tear apart the fabric of mainstream thought to bring you perspectives from the other side of the loom. In today's show, we're going on a journey that cuts through different layers of society, leadership, ideology, and community building. In our Anarchist and Radical News segment, we're putting under the microscope an article from Harvard Business Review that talks about narcissistic leaders, but we're going to peel back its layers to see how it actually reinforces capitalist and neoliberal ideas. Our Resistance Around the World segment is switching gears a bit, focusing on a theme that has historically invigorated social resistance movements. Today's mantra is, follow ideas, not people. And as always, we will keep you in the loop about what's going on at a Radical Guide in our About a Radical Guide segment. So stick around. This is going to be an enlightening ride. Let's go! This week on Anarchist and Radical News, we dissect mainstream ideologies to offer you a nuanced view. Today, we train our analytical gaze on the complex landscape of leadership, a realm that attracts both visionaries and egotists in equal measure. We'll critically examine an article from the Harvard Business Review, Narcissistic Leaders, The Incredible Pros, The Inevitable Cons, and expose how its arguments often serve to fortify capitalist and neoliberal perspectives. Leadership is a subject that often gets glamorized through the lens of charisma and vision. This discussion about narcissistic leadership does illuminate certain qualities that can bring about organizational change. But it's crucial to understand that the entire discussion is framed within a capitalist and neoliberal context that tends to elevate individual achievement over collective well-being. When you start to break down these qualities, a more complex picture emerges. Narcissistic leaders, for instance, are prone to emotional isolation. They cut themselves off from alternative perspectives and become hypersensitive to criticism. This creates an organizational atmosphere that's the polar opposite of what anarchist principles advocate for, which is inclusivity, shared decision-making, and collective responsibility. The issue of being poor listeners also looms large. In movements and organizations that require a plurality of voices to flourish, the unwillingness to absorb criticism or alternative viewpoints is detrimental. This isn't just a hindrance in business settings, but also in social movements where open dialogue is vital for creative problem solving and growth. The absence of empathy in narcissistic leaders poses yet another serious concern. Social justice movements require a deep understanding of systemic inequalities and human suffering. Emotional intelligence is a non-negotiable quality for those who are at the helm of such initiatives. An absence of empathy inevitably creates an organizational culture that is not just detached, but also woefully inadequate in addressing the nuanced challenges of societal issues. Furthermore, the question of mentorship, or the lack thereof, becomes glaringly evident. Mentorship is about passing on knowledge and skills, creating a culture of shared responsibility and collective wisdom. When you have a leader who's disinterested in this essential aspect, it paves the way for a hierarchical and exclusionary system, which contradicts the ideals of a more egalitarian society. Finally, the intense competitiveness that often characterizes narcissistic leaders serves as a double-edged sword. While competition is glorified in capitalist frameworks, it's not conducive to environments that should prioritize social welfare and the collective good. This competitive spirit can create divisions, sow discord, and essentially distract from the main goals of an organization or movement, whether in corporate settings or social justice arenas. So while the subject matter provides a nuanced look at leadership traits, its inherent bias, rooted in a capitalist and neoliberal framework, often overlooks how these very traits can be antithetical to the values of social justice and collective action. It's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole the two simply don't align. Thus, when considering what effective leadership looks like, it's imperative to scrutinize the ideological lenses through which these traits are often viewed. A radical guy, that's what this that's is. What this Highlighting is. the diverse world of resistance. Now onward, with Resistance Around the World, the part of a radical podcast where we zoom out to take a global look at movements, ideologies, and happenings that are shaking the foundations and challenging oppressive systems. Today, we're veering a bit from the usual path to focus on an idea that's not just a slogan, 
but a mindset that has historically empowered social resistance movements. The theme for today's segment is follow ideas, not people. Now you might be wondering why focus on this slogan? The answer is straightforward yet deeply complex. In a world driven by social media algorithms, celebrity activists, and the sensationalism of individual feats, we often lose sight of what truly drives transformative change, the power of collective ideas. When we focus on ideas rather than individuals, we tap into something much larger than any one person can embody. We tap into movements that are resistant to co-option, less vulnerable to authoritarian drift, and more capable of systemic critique and transformation. This mindset isn't a newfangled concept. It's actually steeped in historical precedence. Thinkers like Errico Malatesta, a significant figure in the anarchist movement, laid great emphasis on rational, independent thought as the cornerstone for resistance. He understood that the glorification of individual leaders could easily become a gateway to authoritarianism, thus diluting the very essence of movements aimed at dismantling oppressive systems. So what are we aiming to do in this segment? Two things. First, we'll showcase examples from around the globe where the ethos of follow ideas, not people, is being practiced, offering us real-world models of how this principle brings resilience and ethical grounding to movements. And second, we're going to analyze the profound impact of this mindset versus the mainstream culture of personality worship both in historical and contemporary contexts. We'll look at how these differing approaches shape not just movements, but the very fabric of societies. So stick around as we embark on this thought-provoking journey, because what we're about to discuss goes to the core of how resistance can function most effectively, ethically, and lastingly in our world today. As we navigate the complex terrain of resistance movements around the world, it's essential to remember that the slogan, follow ideas, not people, is not a mere catchphrase cooked up for modern day Twitter activism. No, its lineage can be traced back to several ideological movements, particularly within the anarchist tradition, which has long emphasized the decentralization of power and authority. One of the cornerstones of anarchist thought is the conviction that ideas, not charismatic leaders, should be at the forefront of social and political change. To take a trip down the corridors of history, let's consider the work of Italian anarchist Errico Malatesta. Malatesta was active from the late 19th into the early 20th century, a period that was incredibly fertile for revolutionary ideas, but also fraught with the pitfalls of authoritarianism. What makes Malatesta especially relevant to our discussion today is his emphasis on rational, independent thought as the driving force behind effective resistance movements. In his lifetime, Malatesta contributed to anarchist journals, participated in uprisings, and spent periods in exile and prison, always committed to the idea that anarchy could not be reduced to chaos or mere opposition to any form of government. For Malatesta, Anarchy was a constructive social project rooted in solidarity, freedom, and equality. He warned against the perils of placing too much emphasis on individuals, be they heroes or saviors, because to do so could distort the collective principles that ought to guide movements for social justice. In writings like At the Café, Malatesta didn't just lay out the principles of anarchism. He made it a point to distinguish between the role of ideas and the role of people in social change. Malatesta argued that individuals are fallible, transient, and subject to the corrupting influence of power. In contrast, ideas, when collectively upheld, can inspire generations, foster unity, and most importantly, be improved upon as society evolves. Malatesta's ideas still reverberate today, influencing a range of movements that seek to decentralize power, whether in activist collectives, community decision-making, or online platforms designed for horizontal collaboration. And this brings us to an essential point. The ethos of follow ideas, not people, is not just a theoretical stance, but a practical strategy for building resilient movements that can adapt, evolve, and withstand the challenges thrown their way. So, as we shift our gaze to contemporary manifestations of this ethos, you might notice an apparent contradiction. Here we are saying, follow ideas, not people. And yet we just spent time talking about an individual, Errico Malatesta. But this brings us to an essential clarification. When we say, follow ideas, not people, we're not advocating for the erasure of individuals or their contributions. 
individuals like Malatesta serve as vessels for transformative ideas, and their actions and writings give life to abstract principles. However, the key is to not become overly attached to the person to the extent that we neglect the core ideas they champion. Malatesta is not infallible. He's not an idol to be unquestioningly followed. What's important is the ethos he articulated, an ethos that has been collectively adopted and adapted over time by many around the world. Even as we appreciate the individuals who articulate these powerful ideas, our allegiance should remain with the ideas themselves because they transcend individual limitations, be it ego, fallibility, or mortality. So yes, let's celebrate the Malatestas of the world for their contributions, but let's not stop there. Let's dissect their ideas, test them in the cauldron of social struggle, and collaboratively refine them. This is how we truly follow ideas and not people. We liberate transformative ideas from the confines of individual authorship, opening them up to collective ownership, scrutiny, and evolution. As we transition from the historical roots of the follow ideas, not people ethos, let's now examine its real-world impact on movements. You see, when we choose to focus on ideas rather than individuals, something quite profound happens. Movements gain a level of resilience, longevity, and ethical grounding that is hard to match otherwise. First, let's talk about resilience. A movement anchored in ideas is inherently more flexible. When you're not tied to a specific leader, you're able to adapt more easily to changing conditions. If one person drops out or, worse, is arrested or killed, the movement can still persevere. The principles remain, ready to be picked up by others. This built-in redundancy makes it difficult for oppressive regimes or systems to dismantle such movements by simply targeting individuals. Second, longevity. Ideas have a lifespan that exceeds any individual. The suffragettes may have come and gone, but the fight for gender equality continues. Anti-colonial struggles may have seen their leaders assassinated or imprisoned, but the ideas of self-determination and resistance to occupation persist. Because the focus remains on the long-term objectives and core principles, movements with this mindset tend to have a longer life and can thus achieve more enduring change. Finally, the ethical grounding. When a movement is focused on ideas, it's much more likely to question its own actions and tactics critically. This is because the movement is striving to live up to an ideal, not just follow a person. And ideals, being collective agreements, are open to scrutiny, debate, and continual refinement. Therefore, ethical or strategic lapses are more easily identified, discussed, and rectified. After talking about resilience, longevity, and ethical grounding, you might be wondering, how exactly does this look on the ground? What models embody this ethos? Well, let's start with affinity groups. Affinity groups are small clusters of activists or organizers who work together based on shared interests or objectives. Because these groups are independent but also collaborative, they manifest the principles of decentralized organization, which aligns beautifully with the follow ideas, not people mindset. They can operate individually or come together for larger actions, yet there's no overarching authority dictating the terms. This fluidity contributes to a movement's resilience and adaptability, characteristics we've already highlighted as important. Then there's the concept of the black block a tactic often seen in protests where individuals dress in black to maintain anonymity and act in a coordinated but not centrally directed manner. Again, the focus is on the collective action and shared principles, not on a single charismatic leader. This also functions as a safeguard against efforts by authorities to single out individuals, adding another layer of resilience. And let's not forget autonomous organizations, which operate without hierarchical structures and make decisions collectively. Such organizations epitomize the idea of leadership that's fluid and shared, thereby ensuring ethical grounding as decisions are weighed and agreed upon by the collective, making it difficult for any single person's flaws or shortcomings to unduly influence the course of the organization. In each of these models, affinity groups, black blocks, and autonomous organizations, we see the core tenets of resilience, longevity, and ethical grounding at play. They're not just theoretical concepts. They're practical approaches that have been tried and tested in the crucible of activism. It's crucial to point out that these are just a few examples. The world of activism is rich and diverse, teeming with innovative models for collective action that align with the follow ideas, not people philosophy. Affinity groups, 
black blocks, and autonomous organizations are useful archetypes, but they certainly don't exhaust the myriad ways in which this ethos can manifest. So we encourage you as you engage with movements to think about how these principles might apply in various contexts, and even to consider how you might contribute to the evolution of these organizational paradigms. In a world where hierarchical systems and figures of authority are often left unchallenged, the ethos of follow ideas, not people, serves as an ideological tool for dismantling those very structures of unjust power. At the core of this philosophy is a challenge to the traditional top-down model of authority. By decentralizing power and emphasizing shared ideals over charismatic leaders, movements that align with this ethos are primed to question the very foundation upon which many social, political, and economic inequalities are built. Decentralization is more than a buzzword. It's a functional approach to disrupting existing hierarchies by distributing decision-making and other forms of power among the many rather than concentrating it in the hands of the few, you create a movement that is far less susceptible to the corruptions and abuses that often come with centralized authority. In doing so, you're not just theorizing about a more equitable world, you're enacting it. Another vital aspect of this ethos is that it doesn't merely dismantle, it aims to replace unjust structures with more egalitarian and democratic alternatives. Through practices such as participatory decision-making and mutual aid, movements can create new systems that are antithetical to oppressive hierarchies. Perhaps one of the most compelling elements here is the self-reflective nature of these movements. They not only critique external systems of authority, but also continually examine their internal dynamics to ensure they are living up to their own ideals. This fosters an environment where constructive criticism is welcomed and the movement remains agile, able to adapt and improve over time. This isn't just a political or theoretical point. It has real-world implications. Take, for example, the Zapatista communities in Chiapas, Mexico. Their decision-making structures are fundamentally anti-authoritarian and operate on principles of direct democracy and collective decision-making. This approach has sustained them for decades, allowing them to resist both state and paramilitary oppression. While the term direct democracy might be familiar to some, it takes on a very tangible form in Zapatista communities. Unlike representative democracy, where elected officials make decisions on behalf of the people, direct democracy in these communities involves all members having an equal say in decision-making processes. This usually takes place in communal assemblies open to all adults, regardless of their age, gender, or social standing. The principle of collective decision-making goes hand-in-hand with direct democracy. Instead of a single leader or a small group dictating terms, collective decision-making allows for a diversity of voices to be heard and considered. In Zapatista communities, proposals are openly discussed, dissected, and debated. Members have the opportunity to ask questions, offer insights, and propose amendments. Decisions are often reached through consensus, a method that requires agreement from all parties involved, thereby ensuring that each voice is heard and valued. What's fascinating about the Zapatistas is that their anti-authoritarian structure isn't confined to isolated decisions or initiatives. It's a continuous and organic process integrated into their daily lives. They have juntas de buen gobierno, or good government councils that coordinate the autonomous municipalities, but even these bodies adhere to the principles of rotation and revocability, meaning no one person gains too much power or influence. Furthermore, the Zapatistas have made concerted efforts to include traditionally marginalized voices, particularly those of women and indigenous communities, in their decision-making. They recognize that for a community to be genuinely egalitarian, it must actively dismantle ingrained social hierarchies. To break it down, their decision-making process is not only a political act, but a revolutionary one that subverts conventional power dynamics at every turn. It manifests the idea that the locus of power should reside in collective ideals and actions, not in singular figures or authoritative bodies. By not placing authority in a single person or a closed group of individuals, movements like the Zapatistas inherently challenge the very concept of top-down authority and oppression, making them prime examples of how a follow ideas, not people ethos can be realized. So when you adopt the follow ideas, not people mindset, you're not just opting for a catchphrase. You're embracing an ethos that has the potential to dismantle unjust authority from the ground up, providing a sturdy and ethical foundation upon which new, more equitable systems can be built. 
When we talk about the mindset of follow ideas, not people, it's imperative to recognize its role in systematically breaking down entrenched hierarchies that perpetuate inequality. While dismantling unjust authority often happens at the macro level, think political systems and governmental structures, challenging oppressive hierarchies is the micro level application where we see the breakdown of social constructs like class, gender, race, and other forms of discrimination that exist in our daily lives. The very act of de-emphasizing charismatic individuals and focusing on collective ideals naturally positions these movements to tackle inequality by shifting the focus from individuals who can easily be co-opted by existing power structures to collective principles, these movements work towards the destabilization of hierarchical norms that often serve to maintain social inequality. Consider the feminist movements that employ horizontal organization. These structures emphasize collective decision-making and equal participation, disrupting the traditional gender hierarchies that have been deeply rooted in our society. The aim here is to make the movement not just a space for women, but a space that is also consciously structured to prevent the recreation of oppressive systems within its own ranks. In similar fashion, movements that advocate for racial justice, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, actively work to dismantle hierarchical systems that perpetuate racial inequality. This is a movement that is not centralized, that focuses on local autonomy and encourages multiple voices to speak out against systemic racial oppression. The focus on collective ideas over individual figureheads allows for a richness and complexity that wouldn't be possible if the movement was steered by a singular vision. One should also look at various LGBTQ plus rights movements that reject patriarchal and heteronormative structures. By espousing a collective ethos over a personality-driven approach, these movements not only challenge external societal norms, but also serve as a safeguard against the entrenchment of new hierarchies based on identity politics within the movement itself. It's not just about breaking down hierarchies, it's about preventing new ones from taking root. A collective focus on shared principles allows these movements to self-regulate and adapt, which is particularly crucial when confronting and subverting deeply embedded societal norms. The focus on collective action and decision-making also helps to bring marginalized voices to the forefront, ensuring a broad and diversified perspective that contributes to the challenging of these oppressive hierarchies. This is clearly seen in movements that adopt consensus-based decision-making processes, creating an environment where every voice has the opportunity to be heard and valued. To offer a more international perspective, we could look at the Kurdish women's movements in Rojava, which have adopted a form of democratic confederalism that actively seeks to disassemble patriarchal and nationalist hierarchies. Their governance structures include quotas for women's participation and place a strong emphasis on ethnic and religious diversity. By adopting a follow ideas, not people ethos, movements inherently work against oppressive hierarchies, not just by questioning them, but by laying the groundwork for more equitable alternatives. This mindset provides not only the ideological framework for such a challenge, but also the practical mechanisms through which such a transformation can be enacted. So it's not a passive form of resistance. It's active, dynamic, and reflexive. It's about making sure that as we dismantle the old, we're consciously and conscientiously building the new. As we move through the complexities of social and political resistance, one thing remains abundantly clear. The ultimate goal is a collective aspiration for justice, equity, and freedom. Now you might wonder, how does the principle of follow ideas, not people, fit into this noble pursuit? The answer is both straightforward and nuanced. It allows for a sustained focus on the very ideals that drive movements towards these universal goals without getting bogged down by the limitations or frailties of individual leadership. Let's take a moment to dissect what can go wrong when movements become too closely tied to a single person or a select group of people. History is rife with examples of promising movements that took a disastrous turn due to the failings of their leaders, be it corruption, personal scandal, or ideological drift. These incidents not only disrupt the momentum, but can also tarnish the entire movement often leading to a loss of public trust and support. On the other hand, when the focus shifts from who is leading to what is leading, namely the core ideals and principles, movements become remarkably resilient. They can weather storms of controversy and discord because their legitimacy isn't tied to any single individual. Instead, it's anchored in a collective vision for justice, equity, and freedom. 
let's consider the civil rights movement in the United States. While leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X played pivotal roles, it was the collective thrust for racial equality and social justice that propelled the movement forward. Had the movement been solely contingent on these figures, it might have faltered given the political assassinations of the era. But the ideals were bigger than any one person, allowing for the movement's ideas to survive, thrive, and influence subsequent generations. And let's not forget the Arab Spring, where the decentralization of leadership made it difficult for oppressive regimes to decapitate the movements by arresting or discrediting leaders. Despite varying outcomes, the focus on collective aspirations for democracy and human rights continues to resonate in ongoing struggles across the region. Similarly, the global fight against climate change, though populated by recognizable figures, is fundamentally driven by a universal acknowledgement of the need for environmental sustainability. Activists and scientists come and go, but the urgency of the cause remains. Movements like Extinction Rebellion have adopted decentralized models specifically to safeguard against the vulnerabilities of individualized leadership, ensuring that the focus remains on ecological justice. One fascinating example worth deepening our understanding of is Extinction Rebellion's self-organizing system, SOS. Designed to distribute power and foster transparency, SOS operates on three key principles. Consent-based decision-making. All decisions are arrived at by consensus ensuring that every member has a say in the outcome. Distributed power. In contrast to hierarchical models, power in XR is not centralized. It's distributed among various roles that each member consents to. Transparency. A core tenet of the SOS is that all information is open and shared among everyone involved in the movement. The SOS framework has been instrumental in organizing XR's global network and executing some of its most impactful actions, like the 2019 International Rebellion. However, it's important to acknowledge that even movements with well-intended decentralization frameworks can face challenges. There have been instances when certain XR groups strayed from the SOS model, reverting to more traditional, centralized forms of decision-making. When this has happened, public criticisms ensued, highlighting a crucial point. Veering away from the collective ethos erodes public trust. It serves as a stark reminder that a movement's resilience and credibility lie in its adherence to its foundational principles. This isn't just a shortcoming. It's a breach in the collective trust that underpins the very ethos of follow ideas, not people. When you invest in this ethos, what you're doing is building a reservoir of collective trust, one that keeps the movement's focus squarely on justice, equity, and freedom. Such focus ensures that even when individual actors falter, be it through misconduct, co-optation, or simply a deviation from established principles, the core ideas remain untarnished, allowing the movement to recalibrate and proceed. What we see here is not a mere strategy, but a philosophical stance. By subscribing to the ethos of follow ideas, not people, movements invest in a form of ideological durability. It's a conceptual framework that stands the test of time, uncompromised by individual vulnerabilities. It ensures that the spotlight stays where it absolutely needs to be, on the overarching aims of justice, equity, and freedom. This creates a feedback loop of sorts. The more movements focus on collective ideals, the more potent and enduring their fight for justice becomes. It's crucial to reiterate that a commitment to ideals over individuals is not an abandonment of leadership, but a refinement of it. It advocates for a form of governance where leaders are facilitators, not dictators, where they are accountable to the ideals they serve and the communities they are part of. When we say follow ideas, not people, we are laying the groundwork for movements that are both ethically robust and tactically sound, capable of not just challenging existing paradigms, but also of nurturing new landscapes of justice, equity, and freedom. After unpacking the richness of idea-driven movements. Now let's pivot to examine their polar opposite, movements fueled by the cult of personality. What happens when the gravitational center of a movement isn't a noble idea, but rather a charismatic individual? Well, what frequently occurs is a reinforcement of existing oppressive systems rather than their dismantling. Intrigued? Let's get into it. First off, let's define our terms. A cult of personality in the context of a political or social movement is an environment where a single leader endowed with exceptional charisma, rhetoric, or even iconography 
overshadows the core principles the movement claims to uphold. It's a place where the theoretical framework of charismatic authority becomes the operating system, and it's this very system that often maintains existing power dynamics. To appreciate the severity of this issue, it helps to visit the past. History offers ample examples of movements led by authoritarian figures who effectively use their personal appeal to devastating ends. Take fascist Italy or Stalin's Soviet Union as glaring instances. On the surface, these movements promised change, but in reality, they led to concentrated power, flagrant human rights abuses, and the entrenchment of existing oppressive systems. This brings us to a fascinating paradox. Movements tied to a strong cult of personality often promise radical shifts in society. They tap into the grievances of the marginalized, exploit their hopes, and promise the moon. But once the smoke clears, you find that very little has changed. In fact, often, the systems of power become even more calcified. Instead of challenging systemic inequalities, they reinforce them, wrapped in the guise of revolutionary rhetoric. And let's not kid ourselves, this isn't just an artifact of history. Modern populist movements, awash in charisma and simple solutions, claim to challenge the establishment, but often end up reinforcing it. Behind the attractive slogans and magnetism of their leaders lies a reluctance to alter the fundamental structures that sustain inequality and injustice. Why do we fall for it? Well, our psychology is wired to follow strong figures, especially in times of crisis or uncertainty. Charismatic leaders play to this cognitive bias, exploiting our innate tendencies to trust and follow. It's this psychological trap that makes movements centered around a strong personality so precarious. While the magnetism of charismatic leaders may be tempting, the stakes are far too high to get distracted. Movements based on solid ideas and principles are not only more resilient, but also more effective in catalyzing meaningful, lasting change. They focus on collective aspirations and actionable agendas instead of reducing the complex realities of systemic change to the whims of a single individual. Therefore, when we advocate for the principle of follow ideas, not people, we're not just floating an appealing concept. We're pointing to an imperative for ethical and effective activism. If you're really keen on nurturing a landscape of justice, equity, and freedom, then it's ideas, not idols, that deserve your allegiance. What about NGOs and charities? When we think of NGOs and charitable organizations, we often envision altruistic efforts to address social inequalities, environmental issues, or humanitarian crises. But just like political movements, these entities are not immune to the pitfalls of charismatic leadership. In some cases, the figure at the helm becomes the defining feature of the organization, overshadowing its mission and activities. Take, for instance, some large NGOs that focus on child welfare or environmental conservation. At times, they've been led by individuals with larger-than-life personas, people who can rally donors and captivate media attention like no other. Sounds beneficial, right? Not necessarily. When an NGO becomes synonymous with a single figure, several problems can arise. Firstly, decision-making becomes bottlenecked hindering the organization's ability to adapt and respond to emerging challenges or ethical considerations. Secondly, when the charismatic leader is embroiled in controversy, be it ethical, financial, or personal, the whole organization faces a credibility crisis that can devastate its projects and beneficiaries. We've seen this happen with organizations that abruptly lose public trust, funding, and operational effectiveness due to scandals tied to their charismatic leaders. Here's the kicker. When the cult of personality infiltrates NGOs or charitable work, it frequently leaves the existing power dynamics unchallenged or even reinforces them. For example, in an NGO focused on poverty alleviation, if the organization becomes too tied to a charismatic figure, it might devolve into a paternalistic model, reinforcing the notion that the poor are helpless subjects in need of a savior. Many NGOs and charities start with a participatory model that aims to involve the community they serve in decision-making processes. However, when a charismatic leader takes center stage, this model can erode. The leader's vision may replace collective decision-making, undermining the very community-based principles that the organization purports to uphold. Moreover, a charismatic leader at the helm can also compromise the organization's accountability and transparency. 
By captivating the board, staff, and donors, such leaders can stave off criticisms or critical evaluations. This not only stalls organizational growth, but also poses ethical dilemmas, especially if the organization is not delivering on its promises or is misusing funds. So how do you avoid these pitfalls? For organizations, it's crucial to establish robust checks and balances that transcend individual personalities. Governance models must be resilient enough to maintain the organization's integrity, even in the presence of a magnetic leader. What about when a charismatic individual is the founder of an NGO or a charitable organization? Their vision and personality are intrinsically tied to the entity from its inception. While this can galvanize initial support, spark enthusiasm, and attract much-needed resources, it can also set the stage for a host of challenges. The term founder syndrome captures the complexities of organizations deeply rooted in a single personality. In such cases, the founder's vision and decision-making permeate every layer of the organization, often to its detriment. The charismatic founder often becomes synonymous with the organization's identity, eclipsing its mission, ethics, and communal aspects. This can result in an environment where alternative viewpoints are stifled and critical evaluation of the organization's strategies or ethics becomes taboo. Here's where the subtlety lies. Founders with strong personalities often unintentionally or intentionally reinforce existing societal power dynamics. When an organization's operations and strategies are driven solely by a charismatic founder's vision, there's a risk of perpetuating systemic inequalities that the organization might claim to challenge. For example, if a charismatic individual from a privileged background starts an NGO focusing on marginalized communities, the power dynamics can easily morph into a savior complex, especially if there's no genuine participatory model in place. Moreover, governance becomes a significant challenge. Board members, who are theoretically responsible for overseeing the organization, may be friends, allies, or even enamored followers of the charismatic founder. This compromises the checks and balances necessary for ethical and efficient operations. Founder-driven organizations often lack a succession plan, leading to instability when the founder steps down, retires, or faces a scandal. The financial life of such organizations also becomes precarious. Donors may be attracted by the founder's charisma, but what happens when that individual is no longer involved? The transition can result in a sudden drop in funding, affecting projects, stakeholders, and beneficiaries. The most daunting aspect is untangling the founder's identity from the organization's mission. If the founder faces a scandal or decides to step down, the organization faces an existential crisis. Its credibility is compromised and its mission could be jeopardized. The process of disentangling the founder's personality from the organizational identity can be fraught and painful, often requiring a complete overhaul of the entity's operational philosophy. The antidote Robust, transparent, and participatory governance models from the get-go, even if a charismatic individual initiates the organization. This ensures that the mission remains front and center, and the founder is one among many voices shaping the organization's direction, rather than the sole driver. The principle of follow ideas, not people, finds poignant relevance here. Whether an organization is political, charitable, or issue-driven, it should ideally be structured to transcend individual personalities. This isn't merely a good-to-have attribute. It's an operational imperative for long-term impact and ethical standing. The more an organization can anchor itself in collective decision-making and shared principles, the greater its resilience and effectiveness will be, irrespective of who's at the helm. So next time you encounter an organization shaped heavily by its founder's charisma, dig deeper. Examine its governance structures, its mission delivery, and its commitment to ethical principles. A discerning examination may reveal whether it's geared to perpetuate one person's vision or whether it's genuinely structured to bring about systemic change. When we talk about movements led by ideas rather than individuals, we're not just engaging in intellectual musings. The influence extends far beyond the immediate realm of politics or activism seeping into the very fabric of society. The way a society frames its values around leadership and collective action has wide reaching implications on its culture norms, and structures. Let's unpack this. In societies that prize ideas over charismatic figures, you'll often find a deeply ingrained culture of collaboration. This isn't mere coincidence. When the focus is on shared principles and collective goals, individuals naturally come together to contribute their skills and knowledge. 
there's an implicit understanding that no single person has all the answers, creating an environment ripe for cross-disciplinary dialogue and cooperative problem solving. Another notable feature of such societies is a less rigid hierarchical structure. If an idea is king, then it matters less who proposes it and more how effective or ethical it is. This allows for a more meritocratic flow of influence, where even someone from a marginalized community can significantly impact societal decisions if their ideas are sound. The structure becomes more of a web of intersecting expertise and perspectives rather than a top-down pyramid of power. In a society that values ideas over individuals, the term systemic change moves beyond being a catchy phrase to represent a tangible, ongoing process. Why? Because when ideas lead, they're usually accompanied by methodologies, frameworks, and data that are open to scrutiny. If something doesn't work, the system adapts. The focus on collective well-being over personal aggrandizement makes it easier to confront uncomfortable truths, thereby facilitating genuine structural reforms. The commitment to ideas also fosters greater ethical accountability. In a world where public figures can easily dodge responsibility through rhetorical acrobatics, the allegiance to ideas provides a stable yardstick against which actions can be measured. If a particular policy or initiative fails to align with the foundational principles, it's far more likely to be revised or discarded, enhancing transparency and accountability. When individuals cease to be the focal point of societal structures, we often see a corresponding increase in social equality and inclusivity. This is because the emphasis on collective ideas inherently accommodates diverse perspectives. More voices are heard, more experiences are considered, and more solutions are collaboratively developed, enriching the societal tapestry. Culturally, the emphasis on ideas over charismatic individuals often leads to a shift away from hero worship. The public narrative becomes less about singular, extraordinary individuals who save the day and more about collective heroism, where communities work together to bring about change. This has profound implications for education, media representations, and even the kinds of stories that become part of the public consciousness. However, it's worth mentioning that an excessive focus on collective ideas can sometimes lead to the stifling of individual creativity and initiative. If not managed carefully, the quest for consensus can become a cloak for conformity, where diverging opinions are silenced in the name of collective unity. On the economic front, a society that values ideas over personalities tends to be more equitable. Resource allocation is often decided by community-driven initiatives, aiming for a model of shared prosperity rather than unbridled capitalism that concentrates wealth in the hands of a few. This is not to say that economic challenges don't exist, but the approach to solving them is more communal and less dictated by the whims of powerful individuals. A society that places a higher value on ideas rather than individuals offers a fertile ground for sustainable growth, ethical governance, and social harmony. It's not just a philosophical preference, but a practical framework that impacts how we relate to each other, how we govern ourselves, and how we face the challenges of an increasingly complex world. However, achieving this cultural and structural orientation isn't automatic. It requires concerted efforts, educational reforms, and most importantly, a commitment to shared values that prioritize the collective good over individual gain. So when you find yourself in a society, movement, or even a simple gathering where ideas take center stage over individuals, take a moment to appreciate the profound implications of that choice. It's more than just an operational decision. It's a commitment to a set of norms and practices that could very well define the future of the community and by extension, society at large. When evaluating the relative effectiveness of movements, the dynamics can vary significantly depending on whether they are primarily driven by a charismatic individual or anchored in an idea. Both have their merits and challenges, and both have shaped history in different contexts. Movements led by compelling individuals have a certain magnetism that can quickly draw public attention and support. The power of a charismatic leader is especially potent in rallying people for a specific cause, resulting in immediate and often tangible actions. However, charismatic leadership is fraught with risks. Such movements can become exceedingly centralized, meaning decisions, strategy, and vision are funneled through a singular figure. This lack of distributed leadership not only introduces inefficiencies, but also vulnerability. Should the leader falter, be discredited, 
or face any form of incapacitation, the movement is often left rudderless, disoriented, or even disbanded. Additionally, the gravitation towards a charismatic figure can lead to a cult of personality, risking a shift of focus from the collective goal to individual adoration. This makes the movement vulnerable to the whims and idiosyncrasies of a single individual, which might or might not align with the cause at hand. On the flip side, movements led by ideas instead of individuals often have a different trajectory. They might take longer to crystallize and gain public traction, yet their resilience often proves superior in the long term. Movements like the Zapatistas in Mexico, the feminist movements, or the more recent Black Lives Matter campaigns illustrate this point. These movements are less susceptible to targeted attempts to undermine them. There's no singular leader to target to begin with. The idea, so long as it is strong, can outlive any individual and can adapt over time to meet new challenges. While it's tempting to seek a clear winner between the two, the effectiveness of either approach hinges on multiple variables, timing, societal context, the nature of the cause, and so on. However, what we can assert is that idea-driven movements seem better equipped to survive the trials of time and adaptability. As we venture deeper into the 21st century, the complexities we face, be it climate crisis, social inequality, or global health, demand solutions that are systemic, adaptable, and comprehensive. Movements that align with the follow ideas, not people philosophy, are inherently well-suited for this landscape. This approach prioritizes adaptability, allowing for fluidity in tactics and strategies without the bottleneck of a single leadership figure who could be a point of failure. The internet and social media platforms serve as accelerators for idea-driven movements. In the absence of a centralized figure, Digital tools can disseminate core principles and action plans rapidly across geographies and cultures. This widens the scope and reach of the movement, making it more robust and less susceptible to being stifled. However, it's worth noting that this level of accessibility also comes with the responsibility to maintain the integrity of the idea, as digital platforms can also be spaces for misinformation. While idea-driven movements are less susceptible to collapse from the discrediting or loss of a leader, they aren't immune to challenges. One notable risk is the potential for fragmentation. As the movement grows and evolves, differing interpretations of its core idea can emerge, leading to schisms. This is a challenge that such movements will have to navigate carefully, probably through transparent and inclusive deliberation mechanisms. A shift toward idea-driven movements may also signal a change in how activism itself is conceptualized. The focus would steer away from singular moments of protest or the charisma of individual activists, concentrating instead on ongoing, sustained efforts that reflect the movement's core principles. In a world increasingly disillusioned with individual saviors, the credibility and appeal of movements may hinge on their ability to articulate a compelling idea that captures public imagination and withstands the test of time. Finally, idea-driven movements might offer a more robust defense against co-optation. In the absence of a single figurehead who could be bribed, threatened, or otherwise influenced, the movement retains its focus on its foundational principles. This makes it difficult for external entities to derail the movement or dilute its objectives for their own ends. In summary, the future seems favorable for movements that adopt the follow ideas, not people mantra. Given the complexity and global nature of contemporary challenges, the adaptability, resilience, and broad appeal of this approach offer a promising avenue for meaningful change. While challenges like fragmentation and the risk of digital misinformation exist, the merits of the idea-centric model make it a compelling strategy for modern activism. As we've navigated through the complex landscape of leadership styles within resistance movements, both current and historical, it's clear that the approach to leadership and collective action serves as a pivotal factor in shaping the trajectory, resilience, and impact of these movements. Charismatic leaders, with their compelling presence and ability to quickly mobilize support, can act as powerful catalysts for change. They serve an essential function by putting a human face to the movement, garnering media attention, and igniting the initial spark that draws people into collective action. Figures like Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, and many others have galvanized movements by their sheer presence, serving as invaluable icons that made abstract ideas relatable and urgent. However, the sustainability and ethical grounding of movements are less often secured through the magnetic pull of a charismatic leader. 
Instead, they are often embedded in the collective adherence to a set of ideas and principles. Movements that are idea-driven, such as the abolitionist movements, anti-colonial struggles, and LGBTQ plus rights campaigns, have often demonstrated greater resilience and adaptability over time. They are generally less vulnerable to the pitfalls of personality cults and the centralization of power, allowing for a more democratic and participatory form of activism that can endure the vicissitudes of time and circumstance. In essence, while charismatic individuals often serve as the ignition for broader social movements, it is the fuel of collective ideals and principles that keeps the engine of change running in the long term. Both are instrumental in their own ways, but the durability and ethical integrity of a movement are most reliably maintained when the collective remains committed to a shared idea or set of principles. This duality of immediate catalytic action and sustained principle-based activism defines the multifaceted nature of resistance movements as we know them. So as we engage with or observe movements aimed at creating a more equitable and just world, it's crucial to recognize the role of both charismatic leaders and collective ideals. Both can serve the cause but the long-term vision is most likely to be realized and ethically grounded when the movement is propelled by enduring principles that can be collectively upheld. And when we follow ideas, not people. Radical education, yeah, yeah. A better future, what we really need. Not rooted in capitalism or supremacy. In this week, about a Radical Guide segment, where we keep you in the loop about what's happening at a Radical Guide. First, a shout out to those of you who have been contributing to our living map of global activism. Your input is invaluable. It's not just about mapping spaces. It's about tracing the contours of resistance, which so often starts with an idea, a principle, rather than a person. You're enriching a shared landscape of transformative ideas, providing resources and inspiration for others to latch onto meaningful actions. We've upped the ante on our multimedia presence. In addition to our main website, our video and audio content has now infiltrated Roku and Fire TV channels. For those who prefer the sights and sounds of change, our YouTube channel is a treasure of interviews, audiobooks, and content that taps into the power of ideas over the cult of personality. And speaking of ideas, have you seen our billboards? These aren't your run-of-the-mill advertisements. They're manifestos for a different way of engaging with the world. Printed boldly with the message, follow ideas, not people. They reflect the spirit of this week's episode. Our billboards aren't just public art. They're prompts for public thought. They're turning up in various corners of the globe. And if you want one in your locale, get in touch. Imagine the ripple effect of sparking a neighborhood conversation around the concept of prioritizing collective ideals over individual leaders. For those of you who savor the spoken word, you're in luck. A radical podcast has found its way to nearly every podcast platform imaginable. Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcast, CastBox, iHeartRadio, you name it, we're there. Each episode, like today's, delves into the vital discussions that put ideas and collective action at the forefront. And finally, none of this would be possible without the tangible backing of people like you. Running a revolutionary platform that prioritizes ideas and collective action over charismatic figureheads isn't just an intellectual exercise. It requires real-world resources. If you find value in what we're doing and want to see us continue to evolve, we're more than open to financial support. Head to our website for details on how you can contribute to a platform that's not just talking about change, but facilitating it in meaningful ways. Let's go! And there you have it, folks. We've come to the end of another intellectually stimulating episode of a radical podcast. From the pitfalls of narcissistic leadership to the empowerment that comes from focusing on ideas rather than personalities, we hope today's discussions have given you something to chew on. But let's not forget, it's not just about pondering these topics. It's about incorporating these insights into our actions. As we sign off, we invite you to engage with these themes in your own life and communities. And of course, stay tuned for more updates from A Radical Guide. Until next time, keep questioning, keep resisting, and above all, keep imagining a world that upholds the dignity of all, not just a select few. Hey!
Yeah, talking freedom and liberation. Worldwide, not just only for the nation. A radical guide, it's time to make changes. Bringing interviews and radical education. Yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need. Not rooted in capitalism or supremacy. Yeah, yeah, trust, you don't want to miss it. We bring the truth right to you. The past, present, and future, let's go. A radical guide, that's what this is. Highlighting the diverse world of resistance. Let's go.